You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is John Rubino, author of several books on the economy, including The Money Bubble. His website, DollarCollapse.com. Welcome to the show, John. Hey, Jim. Well, another uneventful week for us to talk about here. Huh? Yes, China in one week devalues its currency twice. Yeah, and that came as a surprise to a lot of people because uh, the, the yuan had been pegged to the dollar and had been fairly stable for a really long time. But China is is kind of a, a currency war casualty because being pegged to the world's strongest currency means that uh, their currency goes up along with the dollar, which makes their exports more expensive, which means they don't sell as much overseas, they don't make as much money, their economy slows down, and that's what's really happening to China. You look at their trade numbers, and they just fell off a cliff lately. And their um, industrial production numbers are also very weak. Factories aren't operating flat out anymore. And that's terrifying to a country like China that has an awful lot of people who don't make much money at all who have aspirations and who need better jobs um, in order to um, to not take to the streets and start protesting. You know, China has massive unrest in living memory, and they don't want to go back there. So they're they're willing to do whatever it takes to um, to create jobs for all the people coming off the farms and all the people in cities who, who want to move up a rung or two on the economic ladder. In the last five or six years, they addressed that need by borrowing huge amounts of money and, and doing the, the mother of all infrastructure build-outs. Um, and that's kind of run its course because um, so much of it was government-directed that it was ended up being malinvestment. You know, it just was stuff that shouldn't have been built in the first place uh, with debt that shouldn't have been borrowed in the first place. And so now they've got kind of a credit crisis, and their stock market had gone through the roof because of all of this, and, and the stock market is tanking there now, too. So so they're worried, deeply worried. And then, meanwhile, the, the U.S., which runs the currency that their currency is pegged to, is going to raise interest rates in September, supposedly, which would make the dollar and the yuan even stronger. So what they're doing is, is getting out ahead of this dollar rate increase, and lowering the value of their currency in relation to the dollar and in relation to everything else to uh, help their terms of trade and also to, um, to to clean up some of the criticisms that the IMF ha- has leveled against them lately um, in anticipation of the yuan being added to the IMF's SDR basket of currencies. That's a little too technical. You know, suffice it to say that uh, a too strong currency is a problem especially for a developing country, and so China's got to address that now. But that's sending reverberations around the world because um, a weaker yuan affects all the other Asian trading powers, and so they're having to adjust. And uh, the U.S. is seeing interest rates plunge and stocks tank, although you know equities in the U.S. are, are back a little bit now. They aren't down as far as they were. But they're still down pretty dramatically. And it's also causing a lot of money to flow into precious metals. People are worried now. You know, when when one big currency devalues, um, that means that others could follow. And that scares the markets who don't want to hold these fiat currencies anymore necessarily. And and, uh, so that leads money flow to flow into older forms of money that can't be manipulated in the same way, uh, which is gold and silver. And so gold and silver are up fairly dramatically in the last couple of days. So I've, I've done some articles in the past with, with titles like, this is what gold does in a currency crisis, uh, where um, in Russia, for instance, or in in, um, in the Ukraine, you know, gold goes through the roof when there's a crisis. Well, um, that is starting to apply to the rest of the world now. When there's a global currency crisis, you see precious metals being one of the big winners. Um, so anyhow... Interesting times, and, and the question is, what does China do next? You know, are they going to keep devaluing the yuan, or or was this a one-time thing? And that's yet to be decided. You know, they've, they've knocked down a couple of days in a row, and um, we have to figure out, or we have to find out, what their target exchange rate is. And uh, I, I suspect it's going to have to be considerably lower than it is now to have any real impact. So uh, this is a story with legs. We will see more devaluations, 
on the part of China, and then more responses to China's actions on the part of its major trading partners, and et cetera, et cetera. And I, I think it's becoming less and less likely that the U.S. Fed is going to be able to raise rates in September because they'll be doing it in the face of an awful lot of turmoil. You know, the commodities of the world are collapsing, and um, China, the biggest trading power in the world, is, is in various kinds of turmoil. Europe is um, affected by all of this and, and just a mess in its own right. Japan is only higher than it is. Um, and I, so I, I think, in the end, even if they do a, um, a small rate increase, interest rate increase in September, um, it will also be a one-off thing where the, the markets respond so unfavorably to it that they have to dial it back sometime in 2016. Any chance that China's going to let the yuan float? Well, that would be one of the logical things for them to do, and then it'll just find its own level. But it, it's possible that it also leads it to become extremely volatile and, and fall pretty hard, which would be... You know, a different kind of problem, but still a big problem. So, you know, there's no real easy solution when you've borrowed too much money. You know, you, you get instability, and you just have to choose what kind of instability you want to try to live with. And so that's China's challenge right now is they've got uh, way too much debt, and they've got a financial system that uh, is, therefore, extremely unstable. And so the government is trying to, you know, push this lever a little bit and pull that one a little bit and, and try to maintain some kind of equilibrium, but they can't do it. So in the end, whether it's through their own choice or through their random pulling of levers, they're, they're going to end up with one kind of instability or another, and we'll just have to see what it is. You know, people in the markets don't like instability or no. the unknown. When you said choose your form of instability, it just reminds me of the old toast, you know, choose your poison. I mean, either right. way, it's not going to be good for you. Yeah. No, no, it's not going to be good. Is and, the rise uh, in gold a, a good sign, though, for gold miners and gold stocks? Sure. <clears throat> if it's sustained. You know, we could easily tip back into a, a deflationary scare um, in the not-too-distant future, which um, sends gold lower. You know, th th this is a really two-edged sword. When you have all this debt, it's deflationary, but the government's response to it is inflationary, and so um, you, you have this pendulum swing back and forth. And we, we've had a deflationary couple of years where commodities were falling hard and gold was sucked down into that vortex. And, and now, with currency crises starting to bubble up, that's kind of inflationary because everybody's trying to push down the value of their, their currency. And that's good for gold, but <clears throat> there's no way to know how long these pendulum swings are going to be. Um, I would say in the long run, <clears throat> the only real solution for the governments of the world is to dramatically devalue their currencies. That's not a, you know, it's not a real solution, but it's the, the only one that they will feel comfortable choosing at some point. Well, if everybody that, devalues at the same time, don't you have the same value you have right now? Um, no, because you're devaluing against stuff. In other words, you know, bread becomes... Five dollars a loaf rather than three dollars a loaf. So the, the value of the currency goes down and your debt, meanwhile, stays denominated in the same number of dollars or euros or yen. So you're paying back your debts in less valuable currency and it makes it easier to manage your debts. So when we devalue currencies against each other, it only gives temporary respite. So uh, for instance, in Jim Rickard's currency war scenario. Countries do this for a while until they figure out it doesn't work in the long run, and then they all get together and they devalue against gold, and then link their currencies to gold at this new valuation. So you get this burst of inflation, where the price of everything goes up in local currency terms, but the, val the, 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 the onerous level of debt, you know, the cost of debt, goes down because the, the currency is less valuable. And so you get that benefit on the debt side. And if you peg your currency then to something stable like gold, you don't have inflation going forward. You have this burst of inflation and then price stability after that. So that's what they'll try for. But they have to come to the conclusion that that's the only thing left to do. And in, in so doing, they give up a lot of power because then they won't have an unlimited printing press anymore. So they won't do that lightly. 
and they have to have a crisis first. So that's what we're living through now is the the series of crises that will eventually convince the world's governments that stable currencies based on something real um, is the best of a bad set of choices from their point of view. You know, they have to give up a lot of power to get it, but if it creates stability, you know, if it stops the, the craziness out there, then at some point they'll decide that that's, it's worth it, you know, and then they'll, uh, they'll go back to some kind of Bretton Woods kind of thing or even maybe uh, something resembling the classical gold standard. And in that way, stabilize the global financial system. And, you know, we, we have to get there from here. And that means crisis after crisis after crisis and, and culminating in something so big that it leads the governments of the world to actually give up power. <laughs> and so it's got to be big for them to give up a, a, an unlimited printing press, which is basically the nicest thing in the world to own, right? I mean, if you could have anything, um, the ability to create unlimited amounts of money would probably be the thing that you would choose right after immortality, right? You know, I, I would I would like to live forever, but barring that, I would like unlimited amounts of money that I can create with a mouse click. And the governments of the world are the same way. You know, they they love this, and they won't give it up lately. Well, I asked, uh, you know, China has government debt, and I said, who did they borrow the money from, and who do they owe it to? Well, apparently their solution is, no, 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 we'll just print more money to pay the debt. Yeah, well, that's, that's what governments like to do. That's the easiest way out. Problem is, um, if you do that, on a uh, large enough scale, people lose faith in your currency. And then you lose the ability to create more currency to pay off debt because nobody wants to hold that currency in the first place. And, and so that's the risk that China would take if it, uh, if it creates $15 trillion worth of yuan and then pays off all its debts. Um, th- there will be 15 trillion new yuan out there sloshing around in the world and the value of each individual yuan will be much less. And so... Uh, that will cause trouble for China. So th- there isn't a painless way out of too much debt. There are just choices of flavors of pain. And so we're all deciding that, uh, you know, right now we don't want deflationary pain and we want inflation instead because that's, that's a crazy world in which there's lots of inflation and, and currencies are being devalued really aggressively. But it's less immediately painful than a tip over into a 1930s style collapse in which if you're in charge, you're the Herbert Hoover of this generation. Nobody in the political world wants that. And so they're willing to do whatever it takes to avoid it. And what they're choosing is currency devaluation and, and aggressive monetary inflation. And so we'll see that until the pain of that becomes unbearable. <laughs> and then maybe we'll decide to uh, to stabilize our currencies. We'll have more with John Rubino right after this. More and more people are looking to the Internet for intelligent, riveting, and thought-provoking interviews. To advertise on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com, call 604-699-8600, 604-699-8600. Welcome back. We're speaking with John Rubino, author of several books on the economy, including The Money Bubble. John, China has been urging its citizens to buy gold as much as they can the last four years. The Chinese government apparently has snapped up every physical piece of gold on the planet over the last three or four years. Is this going to make or, or influence what happens with currencies around the planet? Um, yeah, China's gold accumulation, and and it seems to be continuing right through this crisis, um, gives them an increasing amount of real money that will go up in value when everybody else is devaluing their currencies. So to that extent, China's behaving intelligently. You know, you got to offset with that with the uh, the 15 trillion dollars of debt that they took on since 2008, um, which is now causing them a lot of trouble. But the the gold that they're they're accumulating, other things being equal, is is a good thing. And the question in the uh, precious metals world is how much have they been accumulating? Because they just announced a, um, a 600 ton increase in their official gold holdings, which was very disappointing because most people in the uh, the gold bug community thought it was 3,000 or 5,000 ounces that they've accumulated. 
but the consensus seems to be that that, that they announced the contents of one account and that there's lots of other accounts in China. You know, private sector citizens have been accumulating gold like crazy, and and the government has other places where it puts gold that it doesn't account for as official monetary reserves. And so that if you add it all up, you do get to those big gold bug numbers of um, 3,000 tons or 5,000 tons or whatever. And so it's there, and it will benefit China in some way um, in the future, when gold is going up dramatically against the other currencies of the world. So, you know, they're seeing it today with, with um, the yuan down and gold up. That means their gold holdings are getting a lot more valuable in local currency terms. So we'll, for that to continue, that means that's at least one investment account that they own that is up big. You know, if they devalue their currency and gold goes way up and they own a lot of gold, that's a good thing for them. So it's going to turn out to be a very, very smart move for China over the last few years to have accumulated a lot of gold and to be continuing to accumulate gold. Um, again, we don't know the details of what they do with the gold, or, you know, whether they back their currency explicitly or just uh, include it in their monetary reserves to enable them to play a bigger role in global trade you know, and, and be included in the the special drawing rights at the IMF and, and to be thought of as a reserve currency on some level, you know, at least in Asia, if not the rest of the world. And, uh, you know, that alone is huge progress considering where they were just a few years ago. So, yeah, we, we won't know what's, what's happening with China's gold until um, the dust clears from the crisis that's coming. And then the truth will come out at some point and it'll be very favorable for gold and very favorable for China. But the details are, are right now unknowable. Well, we know China has a huge advantage over most nations because they don't do quarterly planning or yearly planning. It's five-year plans, 10, <laughs> 25, 50, 100. You know, what's their long-term goal here? Yeah. Well, you know, on the one hand, central planning doesn't work, obviously. Markets are too complex for a handful of bureaucrats sitting around the table to allocate production and supply of things. Um, on the other hand, if uh, if you talk about long-term planning in terms of accumulating real money a little bit at a time over a period of years or decades, then that's something that a country can do and and that China is doing wisely. You know, they've been buying gold for years at least and they, they seem to be continuing to do it on a fairly big scale. You know, between China, India, and Russia, uh, th- that's pretty much all the gold that's being produced by the world's gold miners. Those three countries are acquiring it. And for that to continue for a few more years, you know, you're talking serious amounts of gold there. They're going to accumulate an awful lot of um, the best monetary reserve asset. And so that can't be a bad thing. And how good it turns out to be and exactly what they do with all this this um, monetary gold um, remains to be seen. But other things being equal, you know, on balance, it's a good thing. How is all this going to affect commodity-based currencies like the Canadian and Australian dollars? Well, that that's a really interesting story, which I, I, I assume is um, of crucial importance to your listeners because the uh, the Canadian dollar and the Australian dollar were, were really beautiful currencies for a long time because um, China, as we discussed, did this huge infrastructure build out where they borrowed a lot of money and they bought commodities, raw materials from around the world. You know, they bought insane amounts of iron ore and oil and copper and zinc and you name it. You know, they they sucked in most of the world's production, actually um, 40% or so of the world's production of a lot of basic raw materials. Um, over that period, and that drove the price of those things way up, which was great for the countries that produced them. You know, Canada and Australia and a handful of other countries, um, like Brazil, um, sold raw materials into a very strong market, made huge amounts of um, cash during that time, and so their currencies became more and more valuable over that time. Well, now China's Infrastructure build out is winding down. They're buying a lot less of this stuff and the prices are crashing. So those gains are being reversed out in Australia and Canada and the, uh, the currencies are falling. You know, I remember the, 
when it was just flat out too expensive to go to Canada a few years ago. Would love to have visited you guys, Jim, and, and I just couldn't justify it because the Canadian dollar was so strong, you know. And now that's kind of reversed. Now Canada is looking very attractive from the standpoint of a uh, an American in the Pacific Northwest, you know. I could go to Vancouver or wherever for a, a you know pretty cheap deal. So in, in that sense, you're going to see a lot more of us visiting. So I don't know whether you consider that a good thing or bad thing. Well, in Vancouver, a we're a dollar. tourist. We're a tourist location uh, all year round. And uh, look, I miss the, the Winter Olympics. Where every day you could go downtown and be amongst two hundred thousand of your closest friends. <laughs> And that's how it felt. And then after the Olympics ended, it, it, the city felt abandoned, even though you yeah. know there's two and a half million people here. Well, let let the Canadian dollar go down a little more. You know, to say sixty cents U.S. and it'll feel like the Olympics again. We'll all be up there, staying in your hotels and eating in your restaurants. Well, I remember uh, a visitor from Chicago in Gastown when the dollar was very low in the low 60s, and he says, I love coming to Canada. Your dollar is like a small rock. I can throw it a long, long way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, this is a cyclical thing, of course, because uh, it was it was reversed three years ago when you guys could come down here and, and, uh, and have fun for not too much. Well, you know, despite uh, the currency drop in Canada, we still have hour, you know, hours-long waits to get into the U.S. every weekend. You can still okay. find bargains even with the the lower dollar. The the merchants of of Bellingham, Washington, for example, uh, without Canadian shoppers, they'd go bankrupt. Oh yeah, I, I don't doubt that for a second. So they still give you a pretty good uh, discount on the exchange rate. See that that's an interesting angle that uh, that I hadn't thought of, but uh, I, I assume you know that, that not as many Canadians can come down when when the terms of trade change this dramatically. And that over time, that's going to impact the the U.S. border cities, the border economy, because people are going to be on balance. More people are going to be taking U.S. dollars and going north than people taking Canadian dollars and going south. So, um, it, it, you know, it'll be interesting to see what happens to Pacific Northwest real estate in the U.S., for instance, if uh, if Chinese and Canadians are no longer able to. Uh, to buy with abandon like a, you know used to be the case so we'll see you know this stuff is interesting but in the long run it's all a wash you know because uh, we we can't have a strong u.s dollar for very much longer without really feeling some serious problematic effects and therefore we'll take steps to lower the value of the u.s dollar and the canadian dollar will go back up and, and it'll all even out but in the meantime, you know, we should enjoy whoever has the advantage, <laughs> whoever has the strong currency, should enjoy it um, by visiting the the other country. Well, John, uh, come on up to Vancouver. We'll leave the light on for you, okay? All right, I'm, I'm getting ready to do that, Jim. So I'll, you know, I'll pack my U.S. dollars and come see you soon. My guest has been John Rubino, author of several books on the economy, including The Money Bubble. His website, DollarCollapse.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio. Find us on Twitter at Talk Digital Net. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Comments about the show can be sent to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Comments made on HowStreet.com Radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. HowStreet.com Radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.